We will continue with our last session, but the most clinical session of Healthy Longevity Medicine Society. We will open up with a short introduction of the society, the mission, goals, the people, and then we will move over to three clinical cases and discussion around those cases moderated with our executive council. Thank you. Yes, great. Thank you so much for staying. Um, we really f tried to finish at seven. Um, we are 45 minutes late, so please excuse. So we have a nice program. Thank you so much. There were six new members in the last two hours, which is great. So we get recognition. So thank you so much for, for who did it. Um, for the ones who do not yet know what the Health Longevity Medicine Society is, please scan the QR code. Um, it's the medical professional society really trying to um, build the framework for health and longevity medicine. As I already said in my last slide, um, but I tried to repeat to really get it into your hippocampus <laughs> that you remember what health and longevity medicine is. It is optimizing health and health span by targeting aging processes across the lifespan. And I think having these kind of keywords is, is very important. Um, good. What is our mission and what is our vision? Um, first of all, most importantly, HLMS would not exist uh, with a very, without an, a very, very active uh, council. You see the council members here on the pictures. Everybody is here, so please grab them if you have questions around HLMS. They will also be on the podium in a, in a second. Um, the mission of HLMS uh, are fourfold. It's education, which is very important, uh, training ourselves um, and each other to really see how we can not only diagnose somebody in terms of the biological age, but also how to, to treat. Um, set the professional standards. I think this is very important. I'm an internal medicine specialist. I grew up with guidelines. Doesn't mean that I always follow the guidelines but at least I know that there are guidelines and with very good arguments, you can say, okay, I'm not following the arguments because of the argument A, B, C, D, E, because of the evidence I, I have. So it is, I think, very important to be around the table with the FDA, with medical societies, with the WHO to actually have a ICD-11 code for what we want to do. So that's the reason why we are really pushing towards these standards and guidelines. I think it's very important to be united in our, in our field. I don't think that we are big enough to be competitors. So I think really we need um, there with huge networks and um, to work together, to research together. And we only can achieve that if we have a, a research agenda. And as printed here, the clinical research agenda, of course, we have to be connected with the preclinical teams, but I think uh, we as healthcare professionals, as clinicians, together um, with the very innovative um, companies, we have to see what to invest in to really move the field uh, forward. And of course, then collaboration is very important, but that's already mentioned uh, with regards to, to the networks but also with international entities, as I already said, for example, the WHO to really be on the, the agenda. The vision is the most important part because, of course, we need the mission to establish the vision, and that is being an independent medical speciality in the end. I would love to have on my LinkedIn account in a very regulated way that I'm a health longevity medicine specialist, which I deleted again from LinkedIn because I said, hmm, I think I have to, to practice what I preach and so I'm waiting. So now it's just professor of medicine, but not the health longevity part in it. And I think if we could achieve that, at least in one or two countries in the next coming three to five years, I think we can really, as a, as a framework and as a, as a network, we can applaud ourselves. Um, maybe it takes a little bit longer, but let's see. Um, so if you have any ideas how to achieve that goal, please let us know and start the discussions how to get that. And especially also seeing, okay, which country could be the first mover in the field working with the medical societies uh, of that, uh, that country. 
I think it's also very important not just um, staying in our, in our silo. Of course, I already said we have to network. Um, I'm very proud to, to say that a couple of weeks ago, we, or even now two months ago, we met, um, lots of societies met in, in the US, in Manhattan, to really see, okay, how can we enrich each other's frameworks? So AFAR, the Academy for uh, Health and uh, Lifespan Research, the LBA, and the HLMS met together to see, okay, what's your vision? What's your mission? And what we discovered is that there was so much overlap that we said, okay, can we work on a combined mission and vision? So that's going on at the moment to really, not as a single society, but as a group of societies being recognized by all the logos which are in the, in the box. So the WHO, FDA, the EMA, uh, et cetera. Because I think only united, uh, we will be able to really move the needle in the next coming, hopefully months or other years. And I think also not to forget is that we are living at the moment in the UN uh, United Nations decade uh, of healthy aging. Um, uh, I'm, I'm advising um, that, that group, really building the KPIs for the different countries. And what I realized is that there's huge amount of geriatric input, but really not much preventative input or longevity medicine input. And I think we have to be much, much more vocal uh, also in these kind of, um, yeah, gremia. Okay. What does HLMS stand for? And of course, everybody knows this pyramid. But I just wanted to really highlight where HLMS and longevity medicine in the end, I think, should, should stand for. What you see here is the pyramid of evidence. And very often I hear from my patients in the clinic say, yes, but I, I read this article and the mice live 300% longer. And of course, not 300, but then 30, doesn't matter. And so give me that drug. And I think we have to be very, very sure that we should avoid uh, in, in, in doing so because it's really the basic at the lowest level of evidence. Then we have case reports, case series. I think we should work on that. Uh, unfortunately, there's not yet a, a, a journal of HLMS. We are thinking about it. Um, I think how beautiful could it be to really publish our cases we see um, in, uh, in clinical practice. So if you have ideas, please let me know, of us know. Case control studies, cohort studies, and then we are there, randomized controlled trials. Can also be uh, randomized controlled trials being um, decentralized. I think that's the way to go to make it also easier and more accessible. And then the meta-analysis, systematic reviews. I did lots of systematic reviews in the past and I can tell you I was nearly never being able to do a meta-analysis because we do not have the standard um, measurements uh, of primary and secondary outcomes. I think we should work on that in standardization and there were just too few, few trials at all. And that will lead into the clinical practice and the guidelines. What are we doing at the moment? We formed uh, working groups and be aware that we are just one year old. We are celebrating at this moment in time, I would say our first birthday. So we met um, and defined what health and longevity medicine is. That's done, will be published soon. The second one is um, a paper out of a working group from February this year. We worked together to say, okay, how do we establish health and longevity medicine clinics in a, a publicly funded uh, hospital system? There will be a working group on supplements as geroprotectors. Um, there are people now working on, on guidelines uh, in terms of diagnostics and interventions. I think these are the lowest, lowest, lowest hanging fruit levels of, of guidelines, and I even would not call them guidelines. I think they are more white papers because we do not have the evidence yet to really call them clinical, clinical guidelines. But uh, there's one working group looking at uh, stem cell therapies. What kind of evidence do we have? We know that lots of longevity clinics just give the stem cells, and I think we have to educate the layman and the general public where that evidence is. Um, diagnostics is very important, but it's very, very broad from digital diagnostics to biological diagnostics. The use of uh, NMN, NED precursors is a hot, hot thing at the moment. The use of rapamycin, rapalox will be another one. Um, there's lots of interest in certification. We get lots of um, emails like, can we certify my clinic? 
um, there will be a working group uh, on doing a cert, on, on not the certification, but thinking of how can we actually, without having the recognition from the medical arena at this moment in time, how can we build a certification a process or a STEM? Or, um, so I think this is very important um, to say, okay, to, to divert uh, in longevity clinics what they do and how people are trained, etc. But I know it's also very political, so it has to be thought through very, very well. Um, if you're not yet a member, but if you are a member, <laughs> then you're invited to monthly uh, educational sessions. And um, these sessions uh, are growing rapidly. We have them every month uh, presenting a case and then having a very trustworthy professional discussion. And I can tell you some of the discussion, I say, okay, I would never do that in my longevity clinic. They guys are doing it. But I learned so much because there we are able to ask, okay, why do you do that? What's your rationale about it? So please be in invited. And of course, then we have the conferences like uh, this. If you're not yet convinced, um, then okay, um, <laughs> maybe uh, it's not for you. Otherwise, scan again and uh, become our member. And we will now have uh, a couple of um, uh, cases. Um, and I would like to invite Evelyn Bishop, who is eagerly uh, Twittering at the moment. <laughs> um, that's very important for us, so Twitter us, do it on LinkedIn. There are a couple of LinkedIn posts already um, that um, also the, the individuals who are not yet here or not yet in the field um, uh, learn about what HLMS is doing. Thank you so much. Let's get our council. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, questions or we just continue? Uh, Oh, yeah, that's a good thing. Um, comments or questions? And then you have time to get your presentation. Exactly. Any comments? Yes. I loved your presentation, by the way. Jordan. You, you said that um, you started with, uh, you're seeing a lot of inquiries in geriatrics um, for, for longevity medicine. Um, and I imagine people also my age, I'm not really geriatric yet, but, um, but what about pediatrics? Yeah, because we there's, a, there's a case to be made that making sure uh, women's bones by the time they're 18 set them up for uh, non-osteoporosis. So to me, longevity starts in childhood. Oh, I would even say it starts while optimizing the individuals who want to become pregnant. Yeah. Yes, but we have pediatricians uh, here also in the room. Sophie Strauss right. is a neonatologist. So right my, here. <laughs> my comment was that the UN decade of healthy aging, lots of these individuals are, are geriatricians being invited because even the WHO doesn't know or the United Nations that we exist. And I think we have to be a little bit more professionally vocal. Okay, Evelyn. Wonderful. So, uh, should we invite maybe yes. our executive committee to come forward to the scene? And uh, that will allow us also to introduce them once again. So, we would like to ask Professor James Kirkland to come forward to the stage. Professor Thomas Randall, who might not have reached us yet. Professor Harold Pincus and Professor Nir Bartzilei. And the idea is to have 10 minute presentations um, of yeah. cases we saw in our own clinics. And um, then we have a panel discussion around that, that case. And then we are opening it up to the audience. Exactly. Wonderful. So yeah, please have a seat. <laughs> Make yourself comfortable as much as possible. And I will just uh, start off with a case. Longevity medicine case sharing sessions, we have them every month, as Andrea mentioned, in our Healthy Longevity Medicine Society. So for those of you who are MDs, this is not a typical uh, way we are presenting clinical cases in the clinic. This is really just to put inputs um, for a discussion. And one of my patients that I have seen is a very hyper-motivated patient, which um, we very often see. Uh, I would almost call him a biohacker, but not fully, luckily, um, because that would be very challenging. So uh, we always 
start the cases with a short introduction, case background, and then we go through the diagnostics and uh, treatments, if any, then conclusions. And for this case, the medical history and uh, around the medical history, also all the factors that are influential for longevity medicine, so including from, from omics to the lifestyle and the environment. It's a 46 years old male, healthy, athletic, um, equals zero. No past medical history, no surgeries. Also no family history, even in the uh, genogram. Also no immediate complaints, no distress. Later on, there was a complaint of a slight stomach pain. Actually, that brought him to a doctor because other than that, he was more of a self-educator and self, um, I would say, person who liked to self-experiment. Social history, uh, very busy person, lack of sleep, single, no children, uh, all childhood vaccination taken, lifestyle, mostly sedentary, so most of the time at the computer, works um, intensively, but also tries to work out a bit, three times per week, week uh, mostly in terms of muscles. He has a massively disturbed circadian rhythm because of all the travels across the continents. Um, and is in general sleep deprived, uh, even if he's in one place, three to four hours per day because of the workload, not because he cannot sleep. Travels a lot, has no history of illicit substance or no drugs, actually also no nicotine and uh, just random alcohol from time to time. Diet is extremely unbalanced, so it also varied a lot from keto to protein only, to meat only, to then to um, other, uh, other variations. So uh, very unbalanced though and quite uncoordinated. And on the first visit he said, you know, he's just taking a few supplements. Later on, we, through discussion, decided that actually he takes more of supplements per se. So he was, um, you know, referring to them as gerb protectors. So there was NAD uh, boosters and uh, also some of the other gerb protectors, purpose medication that we heard about today and uh, several vitamins and also supporters to muscle building, so creatine and um, amino acids. So bottom line for longevity medicine, this would be a healthy individual uh, with poor lifestyle habits um, that are also affecting his um, uh, productivity and potentially accelerating the biological aging process. Again, he presented because he wanted to optimize your performance, productivity, vitality, but also um, because of this um, undefined mild pain in the abdominal area. Longevity passionate, autodidact, so really much uh, learning himself from different um, also scientific data. So again, animal models a lot, but also popular media and um, this is how he presented. Physical examination, really unremarkable, besides of the fact that the muscle mass was already quite um, developed. Patient had a history of um, past, like in the adulthood, uh, HIIT and other type of uh, sports that led to a good muscle memory building, so a good muscular patient. And the rest of the examination was pretty much unremarkable um, including neurological and psychological um, testing. Vitals were also normal and uh, monitoring was good. He went through uh, screening where we had his entire omics, where we had uh, also an MRI of his entire body, also of the brain and many other parameters. But in order to make it, uh, to, to put it to the point, there was no um, indication of cancer. The patient was a little bit afraid that this uh, stomach pain could mean cancer in the colon, for example, right? So patient very much aware, but there was no significant finding um, on the imaging and also in the genetics. Brain MRI, cardiac MRI, everything was uh, fully normal. And the coronary calcium score was actually also very, very good, 1.5. As you can see here in the metabolic panel, so on the muscular composition and also on the bone density, 
we see quite a muscular person, so well-developed muscles, especially in the core and in the stomach and uh, in, the, in the shoulder area, which is not bad. The bone density was also very good. And here in green uh, are marked the values that were actually abnormal. I should have marked them maybe red. <laughs> but uh, So as you can see, hypertriglyceremia, hypercholesterolemia, um, so problems in general with high fat intake, high cholesterol intake, very typical and very often seen in athletic patients who want to build up their muscles and they, and they go towards very cholesterol-rich meals, um, but also some abnormalities in the uh, bun, so in the kidney parameters, creatinine and, uh, and nitrogen, urine nitrogen, they were elevated. And also almost borderline B12 hypervitaminemia, so too high level. Interested uh, in biological aging clocks and biological age, the patient also required a measurement of the biological age. We measured it uh, through blood age. It was already a, a while ago, um, and we used that markers. And we have seen that the patient was actually, at that time, so the patient now is 46, but at that time he was 41 and biologically 45. So we saw quite a bit of a discrepancy between the biological age and the chronological age, which made the patient extremely unhappy. And uh, some of those parameters, who of course, which of course influenced uh, severely this biological age, were those that I just mentioned. Cholesterol plays an important role, uh, but also other parameters, which I will show just in a while. And despite the fact that the patient was advised to modify the diet, you know, the lifestyle things that we can modify, and also the supplement intake, uh, he initially didn't. So here you can see a flow over just one year. So in half a year, he accelerated his biological age further and then ended up in, with 45 when, he, uh, when, when we met. So what would we say? We don't talk really about diagnosis in that case in longevity medicine and we also do not refer really to like treatment intervention, but definitely the recommendations. So the recommendation was stop current regimen, give yourself a washout, um, especially of the vitamin B12 and of the, of the boosters. Uh, change the diet, you know, implement less cholesterol um, foods and um, those who are less in fat. Uh, physiotherapy of the knee because the patient had such uh, tremendous muscle mass around the knee that it was actually you know, giving a little bit of tendinitis, and then um, the stomach pain. So what was the stomach pain? It was actually extremely interesting. We had uh, another MRI done, and it turned out that the um, patient also used a device to simulate muscles, you know, during the time that uh, he would be sitting at the computer. Uh, that seems like a feasible solution, right, to increase some of the muscle mass, but it went to a uh, it led to a very impressive hypertrophy of uh, the muscles. The muscle was very thick, the rectal abdominal muscle, and caused a little bit of pain. So we reduced that, and uh, we discussed the short-term outcomes and the long-term outcomes. We know, in, you know, we know as doctors that cholesterol, for example, doesn't exactly decrease very fast if you are not on a pharmacotherapy, just in a lifestyle intervention, but in the long term, it would be advisable to reduce it. So here you can see another, so again, this is just an example, that's why it's also in Chinese. Um, the patient uh, had a muscle mass of that, um, of 49%, uh, we reduced it a little bit to um, 45, and the patient um, in general also decreased the visceral fat. We worked on the sleep, the sleep was extremely disturbed and uh, there are now trackers that are allowing not only to measure the different periods of the, uh, of the phases of the sleep, but also trackers that act as mini polysomnographs. So we can see here on the top the oxygenation and the drops of the oxygenation versus um, the same simultaneous measurement of the pulse. And at the bottom, which is very 
almost not visible, but the last, last part is heart rate variability. So to track that overnight and to know how many drops the patient had, um, and after some time, one can actually see if this drop was caused by apnea or by a movement. You can actually uh, understand that after, after a while. Uh, it was very helpful to, uh, to help, uh, to, to improve it. Nutrition changed for, from, let's say, very meat-loaded and um, relatively fatty meal preparation towards rather a healthier style. Uh, with less fat and actually also bigger meals and the activity, the cardio activity increased. So it's very important also to navigate through the exercise to know when should we focus more on the muscle building, when should we focus more on the cardio exercises and how to balance them out. So from 2021, the triglycerides that were like uh, above the norm and also the LDL, they went, uh, they went down. Um, in the year 2022. And the same we could say about the HbA1c, it went from 5.5 to 5.3. Um, we are optimizing in longevity medicine, so we are striving to see optimization in values, even if they are within the normal ranges of, uh, of, of values that we know. And other markers also improved. So here you can see actually, sorry for the Chinese, uric acid. The uric acid was also elevated, but went down from almost 500 to 450 important marker. And another marker that is important for biological age and also in general for inflammation is the ferritin. So the ferritin was increased before, but also went down after those modifications. And um, we repeated the biological age, the biological age reversed um, based on the blood parameters. Again, that's uh, a point of discussion right now about the biological aging clocks and how we can actually implement them in the clinical practice and also how we can manipulate them a little bit as physicians, I guess. And uh, with this, I would like to close so that we can have the time for discussion. Thank you so much. Andrea, would you like to? May I ask the panel about your thoughts regarding this, this case, and then we are opening up. Nir. Um, uh, I, I have many thoughts, but I want to say the major one. Uh, who knows who's Brian Johnson here? I, I imagine. So Brian Johnson takes 105 supplements. And if you look at each of the supplements, you understand why he chose them. But the assumption is those supplements are going to be additive and maybe synergistic. And they're not. Okay, they're not. Okay, and I, I can give examples, but they're not. So I think this thing that, you know, by the way, he's doing good things for the economy, right? It looks like he took a lot of stuff, bought a lot of stuff. So it's good for the economy. The trade-off is that it wasn't good for him and it increases biological age. By the way, Brian Johnson bio, uh, biological age is not, you know, I'm three years in the same test. I'm three years younger than my age and he's three years younger for my, for my age, but boy, what he's doing. Okay, I'm not doing $10 million of, <laughs> of treatment. So there, there's exchange and I think that's what I want to leave you with now. You ha have you seen his la latest LinkedIn and tweet? Um, talking about his men's health? Yes, no, look, look at it. I don't know if you really want it. <laughs> okay, any, any remarks, one sentence regarding this case? So you are saying do not... Yeah, I, I, I think that what he's done mainly is did something with the vitamin, you know, his vitamin B12, I mean, was he taking shots of that too? And I, I, yeah, I believe that his problem was mainly the vitamins and not, not uh, only the, the stimulation of the abdominal muscle. Yeah, so I would like to know what kind of device that is. But uh, anyway, so no centrum, it seems. Um, James Kirkland and then Harold Pinkers. Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, agree. Um, I think, um, again, one of the issues can be the, the sleep thing is probably one of the biggest things to fix, and the evidence is perhaps clearest there. And lifestyle interventions are always extremely hard to do, um, much more difficult to do than 
pharmacologic interventions. And normally you need immediate feedback um, in order to reinforce lifestyle interventions almost real time. Like one of the best things for diabetics um, has been continuous glucose monitoring because then they see themselves from day to day what they're doing right yep. and what they're doing wrong. So um, to, you know, some extent the fact that he became interested in what was going on meant that he might be motivated to do a lifestyle intervention and the one I'd focus on potentially with him given the evidence would be the sleep-wake stuff. Exercise can be really a double-edged sword. Depends very much on the kind of exercise. All these things are a, a inverted U-curve. So there can be too much of things, too little of things. Um, the Navy, for example, is concerned about too much exercise, uh, resistance exercise with microfractures. And they're trying to, because 80% or 70% of inability to field a marine unit or man a ship, even in times of war, is due to too much resistance exercise and not battlefield injuries. Yep. Um, so he may have had a little bit too much exercise of his muscle, <laughs> of his stomach, uh, you know, area. And resistance exercise is generally better than passive overall, but these, these are U-shaped curves and the evidence is less clear. The supplements I'd agree with near, um, sometimes if a person has complaints, just stop them all. Yep. and see, see what happens. Uh, the same way as you'd, the first thing as, that I do as a geriatrician is stop everything. Now, you mentioned before that you're a general internist. I'm a general internist too, but I'm a geriatrician. And one of the things we see in these clinics is two populations. We see older people, um, or are likely to see older people, and we see middle-aged people. And their goals are very different. I've never had a patient ever come to me as a geriatrician and say, I want to live longer ever, not once in many, many decades. Uh, they all say they want to be um, independent, free of pain, free of disability, cognitively intact, able to be around their families, um, and, uh, you know, arguably even continue working. They do not want to be 120 at all costs. They want to be healthy and then just not wake up one morning. The middle-aged executives have a different view. They, some of them come in at first, especially some of, with all due respect, the Bitcoin people, <clears throat> and say that they want to live to be 200. So they're, they're two very different populations, and this gentleman fits into the latter of the two, yep. the, the sort of executive health type yep. thing. And so there'll have to be a marriage of executive health and uh, clinical geriatrics and get, a, get something in between, and there'll be a spectrum of patients. Thank you so much. All right, Pincus. So, um, I don't know if this is on or not. <laughs> but, um, so I agree. I think that there's something going on in terms of diurnal biorhythms in terms of this individual. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, he obviously is quite driven in a number of different areas. But I also want to think that there's some data missing here. You know, I always take the sort of biopsychosocial perspective, and the psycho and the social seem to be missing in terms of any sort of clinical um, assessments of the presence of depression or anxiety, um, but also a look at his social network uh, and the extent to which he has an adequate sort of uh, structure of social interactions and so forth that can actually help him maintain more of a sort of a, 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 st a stable type of, uh, uh, of biorhythms and so forth that in, in terms of his interaction with his relationships. And I think that there seems to be something missing there. Yep. Thank you so much. Opening. Well, could I just mention one other thing? And that's with the sleep-wake stuff, too. In a di I think the psychosocial part's incredibly important. The other thing is just simple sleep hygiene stuff, like yeah. have a dark room, you know, have a set time of going to bed, um, make, make sure that you're comfortable when you go to bed. And maybe, you know, we need to do a lot more in the way of, as much as I hate cell phones, I don't have one. It saves me two hours a day. Um, and this is the rage in 15 to 20 year olds. Uh, so I feel I'm ahead of the time. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that could be extremely useful is wearable devices that give yep. a notion of what sleep-wake yep. rhythms are like and activity yep. rhythms. And so again, uh, another thing you might be doing is too much exercise just before he goes to bed and simple things like that, as well as the psychosocial stuff. So there's a lot about sleep hygiene he could learn, and it's worth spending 15 minutes with him going over that. Yep. 
The last flight I was on with Nir, he got me upgraded. <laughs> Martin, it's the last session to, for today, so it will be all right. <laughs> um, there was one comment here. Yes. Do you want a mic? Oh, oh sorry. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Luisa. I'm an uh, internal medicine and cardiology physician um, and researcher right now. I, a very interesting case for me from the point of view, you, I absolutely appreciate the efforts of building the longevity uh, field, but for me, the case you explained, it's almost the opposite. The, the drive for longevity caused issues for this otherwise, to me, sounding healthy man. And uh, I, I wonder, it, it raises the question, where's the, the boundary between uh, primary care and longevity and how do you see, especially describing the society, how do you see having longevity specialists versus uh, investing um, in training of primary care physicians? And I think it links very nicely with the title of the previous uh, speaker, Preventative. Great, great, great Thank you. question. Thank you so much. And. Uh, we, we, you know, a uh, topic of many discussions, because where do you draw the line? Do we need to draw the line at all? So um, in this thought, the primary position of longevity medicine, as we think, will be under the roof of internal medicine, general internal medicine. So that would, of course, cover GPs and internists and, and those subspecialties of internal medicine that are um, core to longevity medicine. Again, as I, you know, try to explicitly say in my speech, there is, I, I hope there will be no div division and, and there will be permeation or, you know, as we say in oncology, the, the longevity will metastasize into sick care. I don't see a, yet, because at the end of the day, you might have um, per norms, a healthy individual and longevity medicine is about, is about optimizing. And we still don't know what would be the optimized range for every individual. We are getting there. Um, but until that happens, and even after that happens, I think there will be um, an area where we'll be working together. So I don't think we should try to divide. We should try to work together and implement it together. Andrea? Maybe, yeah, I, I think hopefully in 10 years, uh, all the GPs do longevity medicine. So it is like pulmonology. First it was in tertiary centers, went to secondary centers, and now it's with GPs. So for COPD care, etc. So I think it's, it's how to develop. But in the end, everybody is sick. So then we should also bring it to the GP. We really, is it a general comment or is it a case specific comment? Case specific. Short case specific. and then short, and then we are going to the next case. Yes. Um, was Jana, did you ask him about anabolic steroids? Not that he would Just, um, admit to. Right, yeah. So, <laughs> so, I, I manage a, a patient with that and, and with the lipid abnormalities that may have been a contributing factor. Um, and did you measure more than blood clocks, other functional clocks for example? With this yeah, we yeah. measured everything just because of the time uh, limits. We, we Did they have the same sort of um, yeah, everybody, uh, like changes? Almost, uh, almost all of them were up, just a epigenetic clock. Probably didn't make it yet until the point. And your exercise recommendations for like aerobic based exercise, do you, did, in your clinic, did you spell that out very specifically as to programming him with specific exercise like with your team? Yeah, so for, for this, we have physiotherapists that are also trainers that are helping out to adjust, but that's yet another area of discussion. How do we adjust the training protocols for individual patients and make it as a standard? Right now, it's not a standard, but individualized, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You. So Last, yeah. So, so 
very interesting exercise for sure. And, and I, 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 you know, I like the idea that uh, you know, this patient, as somebody said, will go to the doctor and the doctor will tell him, you're right, you're fine, your weight is good, your blood pressure is okay, I pretend to look at your you know, heart rate, which is good, go home, it's, you're good. I mean, this is happening millions of times every day, everywhere in the world. And I like the idea that we should do more because we know that this person has pathology that is accumulating at a speed that we don't know and we would like to know. The question is that you're trying to use, at least in my opinion, the tools of traditional medicine to do an alternative medicine and we need new tools. One of them is that, uh, you know, predictive uh, health is allostasis. And so unless we do some challenging of this individual, we will not know how this individual react in a stressful situation. We will tell us what is the residual resiliency in that individual. If we could do that, we will know a lot more. I tend to agree with you. I think that everything that we see in this subject uh, seems to be anxiety. You know, it's, it's very incredible anxiety. It's uncomfortable with his muscle in the abdomen. You know, who is uncomfortable with the muscle in the abdomen? Somebody that doesn't really live well with himself. Uh, he has problems sleeping. You know, the problem sleeping will certainly come from such sort of unresolved problem. So I think that uh, the anxiety is, is, is really the, the, the key. One more thing I want to say. How do you know that those uh, optimal values are really optimal? We do know that the variability between individuals is huge, and that variability is part of the good life and the good health. So I think that that uh, fluctuation will tell us more about that specific range. Great, thank you so much. Couldn't um, agree more, right? Oops, boop, boop, boop. Oops. So, absolutely, we need stress tests and optimization of what is optimal. Let's go to the next case. A warm applause, or a big applause, not a warm applause, but a big applause for Eva. <laughs> yes, so the next is um, Dr. Uh, Kulik. Um, please, the floor is yours. Same procedure, 10 minutes, and then lots of questions. learn how important is exercise to longevity. I think we age a lot today. So, uh, how do I advance? So you can do isometric exercises in your chairs. You can stand up and do them and relax at your pace and let's go. So um, I don't have a longevity clinic. I'm fortunate to work at Mayo Clinic and we have a world renowned longevity research center. Um, that is um, under uh, the, the leadership of Dr. Kurland. And we are now starting to put together longevity clinic at uh, the campus in Rochester. I am at a campus in Arizona, and we are just in phase of planning. That being said, how do I advance this? It's, it's not so, actually it's, um, yeah. it's going the other way that you would think. This one? This one? Yeah. So, uh, I don't have a longevity clinic. I practice uh, internal medicine in executive health program. It's a program where once a year patients come and have a comprehensive examination labs uh, tailored to prevention but also optimizing uh, chronic diseases. So why I chose this patient? Because I want to, say, uh, to, to acknowledge the fact that longevity care can start at any uh, uh, point in the lifespan. And, and you don't really need biological clocks and full body functional MRI to practice longevity medicine. And I don't have access to that because at Mayo, patients are, um, we, we, we take um, very serious um, a look at intervention we, we put in clinics and they have to be evidence-based and the practice committee will not let you do all kinds of things that are not yet uh, to the level to be deployed in clinics. You have to do them only in research settings. 
And also, um, since my patient is a, a 79 years old, uh, sorry for the misspelling here, I messed the word, uh, doing longevity medicine does not equal doing geriatric medicine, and I hope that it's something we should keep in mind. So the patient uh, saw himself into a home video uh, and, and noticed that he walks like an old man, he said to me. And he was very disturbed by that. Uh, when I questioned more about that, he fell twice in the last two years, fractured his forearm. And um, other than that, he said that his stamina energy level is decreased, but he didn't complain of shortness of breath, no joint problems, no difficulty with mood, no weight loss, a little bit difficulty discerning odors, and it's not related to COVID infection. And he believes that his activity of daily living were not impaired. Um, medical surgical history, he has hypertension, dyslipidemia, melanoma in situ, left shoulder arthroplasty, and left shoulder arthroplasty as well, bilateral hearing loss for which he got hearing aids in 2019, bilateral cataracts in 2018, and again, that didn't bother him. He was not aging in his mind. He, just that walking, he, he was shocked by the way he walked. That is the medication he was taking. When I did a physic, um, happily married for 54 years, a PhD retired, um, and still very active, serving on several corporation boards. His diet was uh, coffee in the morning with croissant or cereal with almond drink. I will not call that milk. Uh, lunch soup or salad or, or peanut butter jelly uh, sandwich. Dinner meat, fish, and a side of vegetables and starch. Physical activity, he goes one to three times a week and walks three to five times three to four times a week and a leisure pace or elliptical when it's too hot in Arizona, which is half of the year. Drinks one drink a day, sleeps seven hours, restorative sleep, no naps, never smoked or used illicit drugs. Physical examination. His physical examination was pretty remarkable. No joint issues, uh, good range of motion, including his shoulder surgery who recovered exceptionally well. Vitals were stable, no blood pressure, pulse ox was good. But the gait was very abnormal. He was walking with a broad base, stoop forward, the swings of the arms was reduced. Just imagine President Biden, you get an image there. <laughs> The, the labs were pretty normal, uh, with the exception of mild increase in hemoglobin A1C and uh, fasting glucose. Other than that, normal, excellent cholesterol. Of course, he was on statin therapy, um, good iron, vitamins, uh, BN12. We did some additional testing. I did an echocardiogram. His ejection fraction was good. Um, and we did also a stress electrocardiogram and he had a good exercise, an average exercise capacity for his uh, age was not the VO2 max, was just the Bruce protocol. His bone mineral density shows osteopenia, but the risk score for fracture was increased, especially at the hip uh, because of his previous fragility fracture. We did a six minutes walk test, which was pretty, uh, it was uh, mildly uh, abnormal and the hand grip was borderline normal. We also did a CNS vital signs, and he scored very well with the exception of motor uh, speed, which was reduced. Uh, the body composition analysis, bioimpedance, bio we have the in-body machine, uh, shows that the patient actually did not lose much weight. You just see there half a pound, but he lost um, two, 0.5 pounds of muscle while gaining fat. And his skeletal muscle index has decreased from 7.9 to 7.6. Now, I don't know um, how good this skeletal muscle index is for him because the machine doesn't give me good reference range. And I will tell you that's an issue. So 
I sent him, though, to the neurology to movement disorder specialist because I was concerned he may develop his in the face of Parkinson with our tremor. And I have to put this paragraph here for you to, to see what is the, the thinking of aging in the uh, medical field. It says, the patient has a normal neurological examination today. We discuss the aging process. We discuss the shifting of the center of gravity and stooping of posture that occurs with normal age that may cause some slight change in his balance. Well, that was not normal to me and was not normal to the patient. So when the patient comes to me, I say, well, you need to enroll in the Longevity Olympics, especially for those who are retired, who have really, their main job is to work towards their healthy lifespan. So physical activity, diet, purpose, and social interaction, which the patient had, restorative sleep the patient had, no tobacco, no substance abuse, but he was not doing very well with physical activity and health uh, with, with diet. And so when I look at his diet and I did a, a quick estimation, his protein intake per day was about 60 grams of protein, which is less even the 0.8 grams per protein per kilogram body that um, we recommend in general. But if you look at the data, and there is a lot of literature saying that patients over the age of 65, especially if they are losing muscle mass faster than you think, because we don't know what is the normal uh, speed, they should eat 1.5, 1.6 gram of protein per kilogram body. So this patient was having about half of that. He also did not have any resistant training. And, and I said, you need to get gradually resistant exercise to achieve three sessions a week, five days a week, balanced training of 10 minutes, and continue with your aerobic activity. And I put him on alendronate, which today I learned that I should have put him actually on IV Reclast because I, I, I learned, I just learned from, you know, every time you talk to Dr. Kirlin, you you live with something valuable. I heard that um, IV bisphosphonates, uh, uh, it's a better option, um, and I will think about that uh, and change the medication. So I saw him, uh, we see these patients every year. So since the patient was local, he's not yet returned until um, um, October. I said, Mr. So, so could you come to do a body analysis for me? Uh, to see how you're doing. So he did, and also I asked him about the diet. He had a hard time getting that in, uh, amount of protein, and he added, a, I, I gave him a protein drink um, a shake as an option, and he followed that. He got a personal trainer, but he was still only at about 30% of the goal that we prescribed to him. Uh, the balance uh, was about half of the time, and he continued to do his uh, aerobic exercises, but at a higher speed. The follow-up six-minute uh, walk test was a little bit better, but again, I don't know what is the um, um, measurement error. Uh, how much you need to actually be better to be significantly clinically. There is no data on that, correct? And the hand grip uh, was uh, uh, improved a little bit, but again, I don't know if it's in the range of error or repeating testing error. Uh, I did a body composition indeed, and you can see that uh, he gained weight and some muscle at the expense of some fat. But I was happy to see that his skeletal muscle index has improved. So, um, at this point, I wonder if maybe I should add some alpha ketoglutarate supplement. I learned that uh, recently from a nice article that I just read. These are my ref. Uh, okay, so so this is what I learned from my patients because I always learn from my patients. I listen to them. So I learned that achieving this recommended protein intake in elderly it's very difficult. 
And you really need to get nutritional supplements, uh, protein, to meet that amount that uh, it's, it's good for them. And, and, you know, we have all this methodology to measure body composition analysis, and we choose bioimpedance because it's um, cheaper, and also the radiology department doesn't allow us to use DEXA outside radiology. We have rules. But, but the problem I have with these bioimpedance machines is that they do not have good reference range for age, gender, and race. And the skeletal muscle index they gave me was not even skeletal muscle index, was actually appendicular muscle index, so they don't even know what they name in their output. So that is a problem uh, that I'm dealing with. We also need to develop low-cost um, protocol and instruments to assess muscle function and cardiovascular fitness because a VO2 max at Mayo Clinic, it's about $1,500, all right? Uh, plus, five minutes walk test, it's not discriminative in young people. If you put a 30 years old, uh, 100 of them to, to walk, you cannot tell which is what, because it's not challenged them enough. So we need instruments that are better to assess muscular performance across the spectrum and to be cheap. Maybe we can now develop with a wearable a uh, VO2 max surrogate that the patient can do on their own and we are actually working with our uh, physiology lab to do some validation of a VO2 max uh, using wearables um, and so forth. And also, I have a problem when we say that aging is a disease and then we talk about the healthy aging because nobody talks about healthy diabetes, correct? Uh, so probably we, so this is the, you know, these nosological uh, mishaps are obviously uh, a sign of an evolving clinical um, specialty and we need to find uh, the right terms and of the right approach, um, and we are having so much work to do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll open the floor to the exec. Yes, maybe we can start from the other side. We Harold? Have one more case to go, and the food is already there, so we have to make it short. So, uh, just quickly, again, I would apply a kind of a biopsychosocial perspective on this. One area related to the bio is I saw that, you know, in, I think one of the first slides was that he had a history of, uh, of various orthopedic problems, you know, with, uh, and I wonder how much there's any long-term sequelae from the injuries he's had in the past and his uh, shoulder and other kinds of uh, interventions. So that would be number one, thinking about it. Number two is, you know, I still didn't hear much, you know, aside from a cognitive assessment about other aspects from a psychological perspective. Um, but also in terms of thinking about his chief complaint was specifically about how he looked uh, and looking old and what was the importance and significance of that and why, is, why was that the focus rather than anything that was actually a pain or other kinds of issues coming forward. And I think I'd want to explore that in a much greater degree. Yeah. And number three is I didn't hear much about his social environment. Um, in terms of, you know, both social network He's and strengths. He's been married for 54 years. Yeah. What yeah. More do you need yeah. To well, <laughs> but, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, happy, a married men yes. uh, live longer, or as my husband said, they just think they live longer. Right, but, but um, I think I want to know more about that, both in terms of that relationship, but also in terms of his relationship, outs, you know, in terms yes. of his sort of social network more broadly. Um, in terms of whether there's been any significant losses or other kinds of things going on. But I think the focus on both the, you know, the past impact of the orthopedic injuries plus um, thinking about why the focus on how he looked more than anything else. So, very good questions. And it's my mistake because I didn't send you the right, the, I have another. So, in terms of orthopedic uh, issues, as I said, he re recovered very well. He had a good range of motion. He was swinging his golf putters without any problem. Uh, in terms of the cognitive evaluation, he did have the CNS vital signs, and you probably are familiar with that, correct? It's a 30 minutes computerized 
assessment that explore different area of cognitive uh, capacity, but also screening for depression, anxiety. And he performed very well with the exception of motor speed. He was a little bit slow on that. And you asked me, uh, the, he, socially he was very engaged. Uh, as I said, uh, his wife is a patient of, of mine too. They're very close uh, and he's very active. He serves on many boards. He's always in meetings. He's, um, he, w he just, uh, he, he was a president of a university until two years ago. So I think he has a very good social. Uh. Jim? Yeah, I'd worry about his neurologic function. So it sounds like he's got a, a central balance as opposed to a peripheral balance problem. He didn't have problems with, uh, if he's swinging a golf club all right, but he's got impaired, uh, so there's something going on in the, ver the vermis cerebellum, yeah. could be uh, proprioceptive as well. He's had multiple fractures. Um, you wonder if he's fallen and in some of, the, uh, some of the times he's fallen, he might have had a head injury or something like that, have some gliosis going on, have something going on, you know, around the third ventricle. Um, I'd want to do dynamic testing, you know, to Luigi's point of his uh, central balance, you know, like get him to walk with, um, you know, uh, holding something above his head and all the rest of it. Yes. I'd want neuroimaging. Yeah. I sent him neurology, as I said, because I'm concerned, I was concerned, it was not a normal gait, and, and they, they said that that's normal aging. But I... Um, I well, you, you wonder about his posterior, you know, the onset, That's what I'm yeah. saying. The you, onset, you wonder about his posterior columns and everything. I mean, what uh, you, say? you worry about his posterior columns, whether he's got um, some increase in um, uh, CSF pressure, whether he's got some, you Norm, know, focal, pressure, focal lesions or, uh, around, you know, whether he's got some progressive gliosis going mm -hmm. on in the cerebellar region or the um, upper spinal cord, you know. I, yeah. I, I'd want imaging. I, I think MRI, uh, I, think, uh, I think you should have MRI. But <coughs> the more important thing that I want to tell you is that why husbands die before their wives? Because they want to. Okay? <laughs> okay. Disclaimer. <laughs> oh, okay. No oh, no comments. Married. I thought you... Okay. No, married. <laughs> Thank you so much. I need 15 minutes to introduce you, Andrea. <laughs> no. <laughs> no? Go no, ahead. No, no. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will present a case which we, this was nearly the, no, I, I said to my, so we, we opened in, in February. We saw the first patients in March, so I don't have the follow-up data. So I asked my team um, two weeks ago, just send me the last case you said. I don't, I don't care who it is because we need a random case uh, conference here. So I did it and I regret it. Um, because it's a very difficult, for me, I think it's a very difficult case in terms of diagnostics, so I need your help. So we are talking about biological, clinical, and digital uh, phenotyping. So the case is a male, British Indian, happily married. So don't get that question anymore, and we have the definition of happily married. 56 years, is a fund man manager. And the reason coming to the longevity clinic is reducing his biological age because he uh, saw something in a journal that was NMN, you can reduce your biological age. So independently of his biological age, he wanted to um, reduce uh, it. And he also said, okay, in especially while flying, I'm not cognitively fit. And he just wanted to, to get it uh, uh, tested and he was quite uh, worried. Um, you see, uh, the medical history is, is not severe at all from a 56 year old. A family history um, is a little bit cardiovascular, no medication at this moment in time. And he took supplements, vitamin D, because he measured years ago his vitamin D level and that was quite low. He didn't know what, uh, how low it was in magnesium um, for, for sleep. Uh, lots of food intolerances and also a quite, I would say, um, a difficult environment when we talked about, about food in the, in the clinic at, at uh, certain uh, times. His physical examination was absolutely um, unremarkable. 
and his psychological background is very important. He, had a, he went to a, a boarding school and uh, had lots of traumas, what to eat, what not to eat, and was also bullied at that moment in time in, in the boarding uh, school. And he absolutely um, uh, was very, very negative about any food, being fruit or vegetable to, to eat, because in that boarding school he had to eat it uh, all the time. I think it's a very healthy boarding school at that moment in time, but he, he really had a trauma regarding that. What we always do is we do uh, assessments, we um, expose our clients, that was also his, his question for the biological clocks. Um, I depict uh, five of them and now you see why I regret <laughs> choosing this uh, case. So we have two um, clocks based on laboratory measures um, in the biochemistry, we use the center clock and we, knew, uh, we use the blood age uh, clock by, by Nu. They um, showed to be a little bit younger compared to the chronological age of 56. Then we also measured the epigenetic uh, age using the 800K um, epic uh, methodology and he was 11 years older. We measured, this also implemented in our clinic, lichen age and he was remarkably younger. <laughs> And then we measured the microbiome, and he was, I would say, also remarkably older. Um, okay, so what to do with that? And I think this very often occurs, at least in our hands, in longevity clinics. So, and I think our field needs to digest these data and making sense out of it. Because we are not looking at group level, what we normally do in research, but now I have an individual um, standing next to me. I would like to focus in this slide on the two clocks we use based on biochemistry data. So the center clock and the blood age new clock. And on the left hand side, I, hi uh, uh, I highlighted two, two um, measurements, uh, ALT and uh, phosphorus. And what I did is in the center clock one, they also using these two parameters and I indicated what's contributing to a higher biological age using that clock and I put in the new reference uh, value and also what the reference value is but also what the optimal reference value is. And what you can see is there is discrepancies between the clocks or there is not a united vision of what is optimal because in one of these clocks I get it increases the biological age, I get two points uh, additionally and on the other hand side in another clock we are using it's like optimal. So I think what our field needs and I will go really back to the case is defining what is optimal and then we should all use what is optimal and we already discussed that it will not be easy to define optimal of course it might be dependent on age on race and whatever you do but I think this is important um, to know as using these clocks and not just using the clocks on the other hand on the right hand side the blood age um, new clock I think it's very very nice the attempt to defining optimal so please talk to the to new team who are, who, who are here, standing there in, in the back, to see how we are doing that. And on that clock, um, more than 70% of the markers were in the optimal ones, and then 26% who were within the reference ranges, and only two who were uh, abnormal. On the other hand side, I already showed you that the glycan age was remarkably low, but the microbiome was remarkably high. So if you look at the glycan age, uh, which is divided by anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory biomarkers, you see that also there, there is not much consistency. We recognize that already. So you would like to have the pro-inflammatory uh, one, so the glycan, uh, it's mature. You want to have that very, very low. Others, you want to have to be very, very high. But I don't think that we yet know what to do and how to actually relate that to certain interventions. On the other hand side, the microbiome age, which is the new clock, I think it's a wonderful clock. Um, uh, but what you see here, there are a couple of species which are much too high uh, or to, more, uh, to be there more frequently or to, uh, not frequent there. So contributing to a higher microbiome age compared to the ones who are there for a, for a lower one. Very important and it's because I understand it. It's very, very nicely the microbiome diversity, which was very low, 35.2. I would really like to see that it's at least 50, 60%, and this is also a nice target um, 
uh, I can use in, in clinical uh, uh, practice. We also do um, the genotypic um, uh, analysis and uh, new is very nicely clustering it towards uh, the different organs and then uh, saying what is the strength, what's neutral and where is a, a focus which we then um, align with the clinical phenotypic uh, characteristics. I don't have time to walk you through to all the phenotypic characteristics we are doing in the clinic, but what we do in the end, in a multidisciplinary meeting, look at the clinical characteristics to say, okay, this should be a focus, this is a possible focus, and this is for us at this moment in time optimal, but that can change because also what is optimal, you can also be super optimal in the end. But, um, it's most of the times for our clients very important to have at least two to three things to work on. And then we are looking at, okay, how is the genotypic characterization together with the functional or clinical characterization associated with the digital uh, phenotype, uh, we say. So here you see the cognitive uh, testing uh, uh, battery, and he is really in, in charge of, of huge, um, huge investments. And yes, it, it was the case that his cognition uh, around all the domains was uh, functioning not, not so well. But I must also say that it was really hard to get his attention. So what really the cognition is versus his attention to do um, the test is, um, is questionable. So that's the reason why we are going to repeat it. But you also see that uh, we have lots of genotypes uh, to focus on. The cardiovascular one, so the blood biomarkers were unremarkable and um, for me, quite, uh, quite okay and some optimal. But the cardiovascular fitness with the fear to max was remarkably low. Um, that can also be that he had not had the, the attention. Uh, it was 19.8 milliliter, milliliter per kilogram per minute, which is remarkably low. Um, and also his maximal heart rate was not really up, only 122. We also do um, the uh, H reader. Um, it's a um, a test very, very, very easy, and that was up, but this is more a screening uh, element for, for cardiovascular and predictive tool for cardiovascular uh, health. Of course, we also do the blood uh, pressure and the post race velocity, and what you see, um, that is systolic blood pressure, even if we normally would say 124 by uh, 79 is okay, but for us not, because we want it lower than 120 uh, uh, mercury. His post wave velocity was, uh, was fine. Um, of course, also the metabolic uh, one, the body mass index 23.6, so something to work on, body fat percentage, waist uh, hip ratio. His muscle mass was, uh, was quite, uh, quite okay and uh, good. We always do an hour of psychological testing, and here you see the test we are doing, but um, it was quite uh, uh, unremarkable, uh, despite of the trauma he reported. Um, but we do, this is very important, the psychological testing, because this helps us really with the interventions, who we have in front of us, and how we can nudge the individuals towards the uh, change of behaviors. Here you see the behaviors, the apple is now um, <laughs> on the grams, um, but what was very uh, remarkable in his uh, diet, um, that he already did intermittent fasting. While doing the diet analysis, we actually discovered that he was already uh, a couple of years on intermittent fasting. However, his daily uh, fiber intake was very, very low, only 15 gram, and uh, he really avoided uh, fruits and, uh, and vegetables and was really only eating carrots and spinach. Um, his daily saturated fat was really uh, uh, high, uh, lots of junk food uh, included. The physical activity we always ask, but we also measure uh, five to seven hours per week, and especially brisk walking, um, and uh, five uh, alcoholic drinks and no tobacco. Here you see our digital platform. Um, so sleep is very important. We have sleep assessments, and what you see is that his sleep was so la la. So the the, the um, uh, total time only roughly uh, six uh, six hours, uh, and not so much uh, REM sleep. And his physical activity was lower than he uh, expected that it uh, would, uh, would be. What you also see here is that the fear 2 max measured by the Garmin is quite okay, whereas when we measured it, it was very, very low. Here you also see that um, I would always use the digital devices as a screening tool and then uh, bring really people to the treadmill and do the fear 2 max uh, in the end. We also use the glucose uh, monitoring systems, um, the Dexcom, 
And what you can see here is really looking at the spikes and really looking if somebody has a spike. Um, it's connected to our digital devices and, and apps and uh, our clients um, actually say what, what they are doing and what you see is that um, with all the three meals and, and physical activities, actually he spiked above um, the 10 uh, nanomole per liter um, uh, one. So while training then also the patients what to eat and what not to eat and what kind of physical activity to use really helps. So in summary, the epigenetic age microbiome age is something to work on. Um, absolutely, uh, the brain is a focus. Um, the physiological cardiovascular is something to, uh, um, to, to look at, especially also with uh, genetic predispositions um, together with the metabolic. So what did we do? Um, we gave because he wanted NMN, and I thought, okay, maybe not NMN, uh, but he wanted a, and it persisted to have a supplement. I gave one gram of calcium alpha ketoglutarate, uh, which is shown also in humans to lower the biological age. We are doing ourselves now the randomized controlled trials, probiotics, omega-3, and uh, we stopped the vitamin D, uh, and we are doing an MRI brain, and from a psychological perspective, really work with the client that that's the primary aim to uh, switch to, to a different diet. And we have a very um, uh, intensive physical activity uh, program uh, for, for him. We also look at nutritional interventions, uh, caloric restrictions to be continued, and especially the diet being very um, focused on brain and metabolic uh, health and of course on the microbiome. We will see um, this uh, patient back after three months um, to, to retest. Uh, normally we do it three to four uh, months, but he's very, very eager to see his success. And that's a lovely team who saw him. Thank you. Maybe questions are from the... All right, so without executive comment? Yeah. What do you want? Do you want to stop now? There's lunch there. Sorry, not lunch. That's uh, it's dinner uh, up there. Uh, one or two questions. Yeah. Very, very, very short because the f food is up there. Two or three very, very short comments. <laughs> the first is I. I, I think we risk using um, all our clocks, wonderful clocks, as outcome measures, not surrogate markers. The second is this is a very scientific meeting, but there's almost no mention of experimental error. Yep. So is 43 any better than 42? I don't know. And then the last thing, just to reinforce Harold, I think the first and last cases, you want to look at their psychological health before you look at anything else. So. It, but we are not using it as surrogate uh, markers, the, the clocks, because we even do not know if they are surrogate markers. We, these are responsive markers. And if you are looking at the responsive markers, there are only four randomized controlled trials who used uh, epigenetic clocks, for example, with lifestyle interventions showing that these are responsive. So also not every epigenetic clock, for example, is responsive to interventions. Um, look at, at the 31st of August, the cell paper will, will be published, and there is a very nice table showing which clocks are responsive, responsive biomarkers. Yes, but absolutely well, well taken. The psychology part, absolutely. It's the driver. People hate it when I say, come to the psychologist. People love it afterwards. <laughs> All right. Quick question relevant to both the first one and this one. How do we cope with patients trying to take multiple compounds, as we were discussing? Um, I, I think what, what we try to achieve um, from a research perspective is to build a framework of deprescribing. Um, so first of all, looking at the pathways which are involved and then building a framework if you want to deprescribe, how to deprescribe. In geriatrics, we have the stop-start criteria. So it's very, uh, very nicely described. There's lots of research. We don't have that at all for longevity medicine. I think that's the next step. And I think it's a nice project also to work together as longevity clinics because nobody has an idea, including us, I would say, how to deprescribe and looking at half-life times because very often even phase one studies are not available. 
All right, thank you so much. With those closing words, I would like to thank the entire executive committee of the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society for being here and for discussion. Thank you, Andrea, thank you. so much. And thank you all so much for being through the entire Longevity Medicine Day 2023. See you next year, hopefully. Thank you.